yeah, yeah. And they don't ever, they don't tell anything I say while I'm praising or worshiping or anything. They say, Lord bless him. Lord bless him. Gee, help him, Lord. Help him, Lord. Oh, my goodness. Well, you can't, I mean, you can't, how could you, how could you go through that and not, and not have worship or praise or adoration or excitement, enthusiasm, enjoyment, uh, real uh, ministry to you? Good night, man. My weapon is a melody. Sing a hallelujah <laughs> louder than the unbelief. Man, that's, that's gospel right there. That's, that's the stuff right there. That's the spiritual warfare that God tells us we have. That Our weapons are not carnal, but our weapons are spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds. That's what that's all about. I don't want to kind of get cranking in that area. I, I'm, I'm sure I will at, at some point along the way. But I want to talk to you uh, today. I believe the Lord has led me in this. Um, believe it or not, and I, I, I don't always tell you things like this, but <clears throat> this message that I have and that outline that you have is, uh, uh, for me, is at least, at least around the year 2000. I, I, I wrote that around the year 2000. And the Lord was giving it to me, and I was writing it down because I, and I really didn't, I didn't know, you know, I wasn't really trying to prepare it for a message per se. I was just reading John 14, 15, and 16. I've, any of you guys that have been around me, especially at a funeral service, you've heard me say at some point during the ceremony or graveside or whatever, wherever it might be, I will say in that service, my favorite passage of Scripture is John 14, 1. And it says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will surely come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you might be also. And the way you know, and Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man comes to the Father but, but by me. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, that is the beginning. That's, that's the text. That's the beginning text of a sermon that Jesus preaches for three chapters in the Gospel of John. It's considered really one of the three greatest sermons that Jesus preached. Now, I mean, I'm not the one trying to put some kind of evaluation on how good Jesus' sermons were. I think, and I know, and everybody else that loves the Lord and is saved knows that everything Jesus said in the scriptures is important and is wonderful. All the parables that he said, all of the, the stories, all the directions, all the miracles, I mean, everything that Jesus did, you, you just really can't draw lines and say, this is more significant than this. But there are, but there are three, three groups of, of scriptures that, that seem to be uh, uh, some, some really tremendous groundbreaking things that Jesus said to the earth that we needed to hear. One was to lost people. And it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And then the second is the Olivet Discourse, which he spoke to the Jews who asked him, what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age and all of these things. And Jesus talked about tribulation and all of the uh, Jewish plight and so forth about being prepared and being ready. And then this one. This one is called the Upper Room Discourse. Yeah, yeah. Because it was given in the Upper Room. And... It was given on the night that Jesus was, was betrayed. So just a few hours before Jesus would be arrested by the Roman soldiers and taken, and taken through those unlawful trials, all of them at night, which was totally illegal, and then being scourged by morning time, whipped and beaten so bad he, you couldn't even tell he was a man, and then given a cross to carry to Golgotha, to Calvary, so heavy and so weighty and so much blood loss and, and so much torture and torment and anxiety and stress on his body that he could barely carry the cross. And Simeon was compelled along about half the way to carry it the rest of the way for him. They thump it down in a hole 
on Calvary with his body nailed hands and feet to the cross. Just before that, these are the words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Not to, not, not to the world out there. Not to lost people. Not to Jewish people per, per se. But to his 11. In chapter 13 of John, Judas leaves to do his dirty deed. And then just a few more verses that Jesus kind of says, all right, guys, I want you to get ready for this because it's going to really be a tough time and you're going to need each other. So, uh, you know, what, what I say to you is love one another because you're going to need each other and cling to each other and all of that. And then he says, and let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also. In... And then he, then he breaks into three chapters of tremendous teaching about about something that they desperately needed and we desperately need. And, and, you, come to the, and you come to the last verse of that little discussion, talk, that, press, that message, and the concluding verse right at, before the invitation was, um, these things I say to you that in me, you might have peace. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So between, let not your hearts be troubled, and these things I say, that in me you might have peace, come some tremendous blocks of theology and information that speaks to us about how to have peace in the midst of being crushed yeah. in life. Now, let me just set this up a second. I'm going to point out several scriptures and, and just kind of go with me, and I'm, I'm kind of ambling around because I want you to, to see a couple of things about peace and how important it is and what I'm talking about when I say peace and why God says that peace is so important to you. Uh, look in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, verse 27, this is Jesus speaking, and it's during this discourse, and it's along the way, and Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus, in talking to his disciples and to us, Jesus is telling us that he has a peace that is different from the world's peace. And that this world can't really give you peace. And so Jesus said, the peace I'm talking about is a different kind of peace. It's my peace, he says. Not as the world gives, but the kind of peace that only I can give. And this is the kind of peace I think that the Apostle Paul is describing in Philippians 4. It's up here, verse 7. In verses 1 through 6 of Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul describes six, uh, six entities that are necessary for a, a great peace to come in life. And he concludes it in verse 7 by saying, and, okay, he's, he's got six of them, you know, and then he says, and, you do all these things, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So God is talking to us, Christ is talking to us, about a type of peace that we're going to need to make it in this, in this agitating, pressing, scourging, harassing world that we're going to be living in. And it's, and it's a peace that is so deep that it, that it can't even be understood by the human mind. Yeah, yeah. Now, I will say this to you, that what, what I have found in my life, and this is just from a psychological, mental point of view, not necessarily even spiritual point of view, but I have found that when my mind is weary and when my spirit is troubled, when my body is, is tired, and when, and when I'm confused and frustrated and anxious and frightened, there are two things that are needed for me to revive. One is order. 
lack of confusion, clean place, things in order, not thrown everywhere, piled everywhere. There's order. My, my, my mind goes, my mind breathes. Because you get that sense of, of calm. And I need peace. I need order and I need peace. And so I think it is to us that Jesus is speaking in John 14, 15, and 16 about this amazing this amazing prize he gives us of peace that will help us in the midst of this tribulation that the world is going to throw at us and that all of us live in nowadays. And I don't know about you, but it just it's not getting easier. It's getting worse. It's getting, I mean, it's terrible. And it seems to be just moving downhill fast. And so I, for some reason, the Holy Spirit kind of led me back to a folder and I opened it up and I saw this. I said, oh my goodness, that was when I was studying. And I started looking at it and, and I thought, okay. Now this just kind of, I thought, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in me, believe in God, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Wonderful, wonderful. Then he starts telling all those things. And then he says, at the end, he says, these things I have said to you yeah, yeah. that you might then me have peace. And then it dawned on me, what things? What did you say, Jesus, that will give me peace in you? So between the first verse of the text in chapter 14, verse 1, and the closing verse, Jesus speaks some things that are going to bring us peace in the midst of this tribulation. The Gospel of John is an amazing book, and I, I know you know that all of them are, but I just want to show you this. The Gospel of John in chapter 20, which is the next to the last chapter, tells you what, what the purpose of the book is. And I just want you to see this because I want you to, I want you to, I want you to understand or, or, or surmise where, where you are today. I know where I am, and I know what God says to me. But what about you? I mean, what, what, what is God's purpose for us? What does God want for us? Well, the Gospel of John says... And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. The Gospel of John doesn't have all of the miracles of Jesus written like maybe the Gospel of Luke has, and the Gospel of Mark has, and even Matthew has. John only has seven miracles. That's all John chose to, to, to write in the Gospel, seven miracles of Jesus. And so he says, I haven't written, I haven't even tried to write all the miracles of Jesus. If you read the last chapter and the last verse of the Gospel of John, you will hear him say, uh, all of the things that Jesus did while he was on the earth are not written in this book. For I suppose that if all the things that Jesus did while he was here on earth were written, all the volumes of the world could not contain it. But John goes on to say, but these are written. Okay, John, why, why are the ones you have written? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So for the unbeliever, the purpose of the Gospel of John is, I've written these things down so that you might know that Jesus is the Son of God and believe on him as Christ in your life. So for anybody that would read the Gospel of John and, and not know the Lord, John says, my purpose is that you would come to the Lord and know the Lord. And then once you come to the Lord, for you believers, it is written that believing you might have life in his name. So God's purpose for the lost is that they would believe and come to the Lord. God's purpose for the saved is that it might enhance our life. And we might get life in the name of Jesus. And I just want to ask you, do you have life in the name of Jesus? I mean, I know you're a believer. I'm not trying to say you're lost. I'm just asking you, you're a believer. Uh, the purpose is that you can have life. Are you having life? Are you living life? Are you moving in life? Is life a drudgery, a burden, a concern, a hurt, a loss? I mean, 
Do you have life in his name? Because that's God's purpose for you. That's what God wants for you. That's what the word is written for you. That's what the Holy Spirit's power is in your life, that you might have life. And then, and then in, in, in Matthew, Matthew's going to say kind of basically the same thing, but, but look at what he says. He said, this is Jesus speaking, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I just want to ask you, uh, uh, is your soul at rest? Are you finding rest for your soul? Or is it all anxious and confused and frustrated and annoyed and stirred up and and, 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 and violated, God says, my purpose is that you can have some rest. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it, really? Hear somebody say, I want you to rest. Oh, my, that's a wonderful word. And then he says at the end of the gospel, uh, chapter 16, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. Uh, that word tribulation. It, it, one of the reasons the Lord gave us his word in such unique languages as Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek is because they're so precise. And the English language, as an example, is not a precise language. The English language just makes stuff up. Uh, I was speaking with Bell before the service, and I said, you know, like, like the word bad. What does that mean? Well, it means not good, or it means real good. Same word, just depends on how you say it and what kind of inflection and what your countenance says. You're bad. Oh, you're bad, man. I mean, that's, a, that, that's ridiculous. How would anybody know who couldn't see what we meant by that? Or I love you. Well, I love my, my wife. I love my children. I love my dog. I, love, I really don't. I love my ice cream. I know some of you do. I know some of you. Hey, I don't love my dog. My wife loves my dog. I love my wife. That's, so I, I tolerate the dog because I love my wife. So there you go. Hey, when you love somebody, you love the stuff they love. That's all I'm saying to you. And if you hadn't got on board with that, Welcome to, the, uh, welcome to Relationships 101. Get on that. <laughs> but anyway, you see what I mean. That, and so in the, Greek, in the Greek, when this was translated, when this word was given tribulation, in this world you will have tribulation. All right, first place, why? I mean, why would God allow us to have tribulation? Because he could stop it. You know, he does, we don't have to have it. He, he just says, okay, but you are going to have it. You're going to have tribulation. The word tribulation, and you don't need to remember this Greek word, but, but you just need, remember, need to remember the concept. It's the word thlipsis. And thlipsis means to be pressed or to be crushed like you would do grapes, like someone who takes grapes and puts them in the vat and then stomps them to get the juice out of them so you can make wine and enjoy the use of the grape. That's what the word thlipsis means. And so just knowing that, it might give us some little indication as to why God lets us have it, you know? Because I don't know about you, but when I came to the Lord and I was in church and I was listening to what the pastor was saying, I, I kind of got the idea that, you know what my job is as a Christian? My job as a Christian is to bear fruit. Now, what that means, you know, I, I really didn't know, but I just kind of pictured it this way. I kind of pictured it, you know, like one day Jesus would just come and look at me and I would be all clustered up, all my fruit, and he would look at me and he would go, man, you are doing so good. You just have all of those nice clusters of fruit all over you. You are awesome, as if the producing of fruit is the objective. Now, I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound like double talk, but what I've come to the conclusion now, after all these years with the Lord, is that God 
is not necessarily after fruit. He's after the fruit of the fruit. Now, I know that sounds like double talk, right? Let me say it again. That God is not necessarily after the fruit, but he's after the fruit of the fruit. Think it this way. You know some farmers? Some of you have been farmers, right? Or you planted crops, right? All right, as a farmer, and don't answer too quick now, but just think about this. As a farmer, was the goal of your planting a crop that that crop might bear fruit? Now, don't answer too quick. Don't get stuck. Now, just think about that. All right, I'm a farmer. I put seed in the ground. And my purpose is to get those crops to come up and have fruit all over them. That's my purpose in this farm. No. Isn't the purpose that you would harvest the fruit? Not just that they would produce it, but that you could get it, and then you could take it, and then you could turn it into something that could be used so that you could receive reward from that, which could be used that's what I'm talking about, the fruit of fruit. Uh, look, the, the, the purpose of planting something is not so that it will grow up and have a nice, pretty crop on it. It's so that it would grow up and you could take, you could pick that crop and then you could produce from that crop the use of that crop so that crop could be used. Philipsis. Philipsis. In this world, you shall have... Crushing. And God, look, 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 God could stop that, but he doesn't. You know why? Because it serves his purpose. The devil is a barking pit bulldog. Out in the road of life. You're walking down the road as a child of God, just minding your own business, just sweet as can be and gentle. Got all kind of fruit just growing all over you. We, we, no crushing yet, you know. But one of these boy, I mean, it's going to be good one of these days. You know? And then all of a sudden, here comes the devil's pit bull out. Rah, 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 and, and, and it just scares you to death. And what is the first thing you do? First thing you do is, Papa! You run to Papa. So the purpose of the pit bull is to run you to Papa. God knows that. And so it serves God's purpose to allow you to be crushed so that the fruit that is on you becomes usable so that the people out here that need it can actually get something that is of use in their lives. So, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Don't worry about it. Be a good cheer. I will overcome the world. I got you. Hey, I know it's frightening. I know it's kind of scary. But don't worry. Uh, I can control this. I got it. I got it. I got it. And, I, and I'll share some stuff with you so that you can have peace and, and you won't have to be all upset and, and worried. And so, between 14.1, let not your heart be troubled, and... These things I say that you might have peace, all in between there, five things. Listen, to the extent that you believe these five things, you will have peace. Okay, just so that doesn't pass over. If to the extent that you don't believe this, you're going to have trouble in the midst of trouble. In other words, you want to grab on and believe it, all of this. Because the more you believe it, the more peace it's going to give you. The less you believe it, the more trouble you're going to have in the midst of your trouble. All right, what are the five things that Jesus said that will give us peace while we're being crushed? Number one, first truth, Jesus is God. Now, I know you're sitting there going, well, I've never had trouble with that. Well, do you know that there are lots of people in this world, and even right now especially, that have real trouble with that? <laughs> Jesus is not confused about who he is. Yeah. Yeah. This world is confused about who Jesus is. And this world does a lot of talking about Jesus that hadn't got anything to do with Jesus. 
This world does a lot of thanking God and, and, and saying things about God and invoking the name of God in all these situations that don't have anything to do with the reality of God. Jesus said, I'm not confused about, about who I am. Look, 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 look. I mean, the sheer audacity of this. Look, let not your hearts be troubled. He's talking to these Jews. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Jesus said, you people who have written God's name in a, in a, in a way that it can't even be spoken. Y-H-W-H is what the Jews call God so nobody could even pronounce the name of God. God was so holy to them. God was so high. God was so exalted. God was so big and powerful. They didn't even want to say his name and they created a name for God in their language that could not even be pronounced. And to that group of people... Not sheepishly, not sheepishly. No, uh, uh, let not your heart be troubled when you believe in God. But boldly, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. I am God. I'm equal with God. If you believe in God, you believe in me because I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm equal to him. I am God. Now, he better be who he says he is. When he says that to them, and he is, and he backs it up with just more of the same. Look, in my father's house are, the, are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself. Uh, is there any ambig ambiguity about that? I mean, is Jesus confused about who he is and, and what he can do and what he's going to do for you. I mean, he's not, he's not speaking a parable here, is he? This is not some story that has to be interpreted for everybody, right? He's just playing out, bold face, saying, I'm going away, I'm coming back, it's me, and where I am there you might be also, and where you go, and where I go you know, and the way, and Thomas said we don't know the way, and then Jesus said, man, you're talking about a dynamic little statement right here. Uh, I am the way so that you can know how to be saved. Yeah, yeah. I'm the way to be saved. I'm the way to God. I am the way so you could be saved. I am the truth so you can be sure. Are you sure? This is the truth. Yeah, yeah. The truth says, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. And then he looks there and he says, and I am the life so that you can be satisfied. I am the way so that you can be saved. I'm the truth so you can be sure. And I'm the life so you can be satisfied. I am it. And I am the way to God. And this is just so profoundly simple. And yet so pr profoundly dynamic. That Jesus would look at them and said, If you will believe that I am God, you will have peace in your heart when you are in the midst of of trouble and tribulation. And I hear these people, you say, how would that help me? How many? Well, I hear these people get up and man, athletes, entertainers, uh, politicians, uh, backwoods, varmints, uh, wh whatever they might be. And they say, and they say, well, I just want to thank God. It's almost like serial killers get up and say, I just thank God for giving me the mission to kill my family. I mean, you know, it's just really about that ridiculous. Jesus said, everybody talking about God ain't talking about God. He said, if you don't believe in me, you don't believe in God. These people run around talking about all of these religions and philosophies and isms that ought to be wasms all over the world and all this quackery and foolishry and ignorance on display. Talking about God this and God that. That's not your God. That's not Jesus God. Jesus said, I'm God. If you believe in the Father, believe also in me. Man, you're talking about having peace. 
You can't even begin to have peace until you get the prince of peace living on the inside of you. I mean, we experience just a little bit of peace. I mean, an inkling of peace. The world gets drug across reluctantly. The world gets reluctantly dragged across some small amount of peace on one day every year, Christmas Day. Christmas Day every year, the world, I mean, the uh, uh, little town of Bethlehem, uh, Babe in a Manger, uh, Silent Night, uh, uh, the first Noel, uh, you know, all of that season. You go into stores and you hear music playing about Christ the King and he's the light and he's the baby and he's coming on it. And the world is just being reluctantly dra- dragged into some sense of peace through the real God. Just imagine how profound things would be if we really sought him. The more you look at Jesus, the more peace you'll have. My theory again, the devil hates Jesus, but he can't get to Jesus. But he can get to you. And you'll do. Because he's that pit bull. (laughs) God lets him go because God needs him. Because you need to be running to him. And the more you run to him, the more peace you get in life. These things I say to you that you, that in me you might have peace. What things? I'm God. Second thing. The Holy Spirit indwells those who believe in Jesus. Yeah. You have on the inside of you a spirit that is God. Uh, Jesus says to him, uh, as he goes on through the 14th chapter, he says, okay, guys, you need to know this. Um, I'm leaving you. And I know that that's, that's going to make your heart troubled a little bit. I know it's, but, but I, I'm leaving you. But, but look, look, don't, don't let it trouble you. Don't let it trouble you. Because here's why. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that might abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. There's no ambiguity about that, is it? Um, That's pretty plain, right? This is Jesus' theology of the Holy Spirit. It's the theology of the Trinity, actually. I mean, you you, want to, you know, people talk about, uh, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, that's because they haven't read the Bible. But anyway, regardless of that, there's a lot of people have doubts or questions or thoughts about, you mean there's three gods? There's a, no, no. Look, look at what Jesus said. In this passage, he said, I'm going to send another comforter. In the first verse, he said, you believe in God, believe also, believe along with that in me. So Jesus says, all right, I got a father in heaven. And now I got me, the son, and then he says in verse 16, and we got another member of this trinity, and it's a comforting spirit, and he's going to come live in you and be with you. That word comforter is from the word parakletos, from which we get our English word paraclete, which means one who stands beside you. In other words, one just like me, not a substitute not a counterfeit, not, not, a, not, not, a, not a model, but one just like me. So Jesus said, if you read John 14, 15, 16, you'll get Jesus' theology of the Holy Spirit. You know what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit? Jesus said the Holy Spirit is here to teach you, to lead you, to help you remember the things that Jesus has spoken to you, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to be in you and empower you to witness for him and be a force for him whenever there's times of great stress. What a comfort to us. What a comfort to us. We have never seen Jesus except by faith. Not one person in this room has ever seen the Jesus we say we love except by faith. 
But yet this passage tells us that even though we have never seen him except by faith, we experience him in the same exact way as these guys who were standing there looking at him and listening to him say these words. The same Holy Spirit that lives in them lives in you. Empowers you, strengthens you, moves in you, walks in you, leads you, instructs you, convicts you. It's the same Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, all right, want to have peace when you're being crushed? Believe in me as God. I'm God. You got to know that. There's not another one. You got to trust me. And then allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in you. Because he's going to come and live inside you. Don't be afraid of him. Don't run away from him. I'm sending him in there because he's, my, he, he's the Spirit of God and he lives on the inside of you. Then here's the third one. Your life will be fruitful as you stay committed to Jesus and faithful to a local body of believers. All right. I know that's a long sentence. <laughs> Here it is. Your life will stay fruitful as long as you stay committed to Jesus. Okay, everybody, nobody disagrees with that, right? Okay. What about the rest of it? And faithful to a local body of believers. What about that? Well, let me just show you what I'm talking about. In John 15, you have the teaching of Jesus about the vine and the branches. And, and here's what, what he says. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. All right, is there any question so far? Jesus is the vine, and, and God is the one who takes care of the vine. He's the, he's the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. All right? Every branch, say those next two words, in me. All right, every branch, in me, not bearing fruit, he lifts up. And every branch bearing fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Look at verse 6. If anyone, read those next two words, does not, if anyone, say it again, does not abide in me. He is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them in the fire and they are burned. Now the reason I had you say those two, two places in the in scripture is sometimes people get those mixed up and they get all scared and afraid like God's going to somehow cut them off from the vine and throw them in the fire. Like God's going to take your salvation away from you and, and send you to hell because you don't, you're not, you don't have fruit on you at the time. You're not bearing fruit. That's pr that, that, is, that is present tense. That verse is present tense, that you are presently not bearing fruit. It doesn't mean that you'll never bear any. It just means right now your, your life's messed up and you're not bearing fruit like you ought to. Verse, well, let me go back. Verse 2 says, every branch in me... And verse 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, two different people totally. One of them is saved, but has joined to Christ, and one of them has never been joined to Christ. Talking about two different kind of people here. Nothing to be afraid of. Let me show you what this is talking about. What this is talking about is, all right, you have a vine have any of you ever grown like grapes or scuppernauds, muscadines, any things like vine stuff? All right, if you've grown vine stuff, especially if it's, if it's vines that have to be trimmed from year to year so the new growth will put on new fruit and stuff, if it's like that, then you know, you know what he's talking about here, about being lifted up. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Jesus is saying, all right, I'm the vine and you're a branch. You, as a branch, are attached to the vine. It's the vine that gives you your life, your nourishment, and, and, and helps you bear fruit. But sometimes, and this is a real problem that Christians won't bear fruit at some time, 
Don't get me wrong. I'm not praising this. Our life ought to always be bearing fruit. But, and don't answer out loud. Have, do you always bear fruit? Uh, it depends on what day you're talking about. Right? Sometimes I am and sometimes ooh, I'm not. I might be bearing some, but it's not good fruit. <laughs> Got worms in it and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, all right, so we all agree as children of God that there are times in our life where we are not bearing fruit. So what does God do to us? I mean, how does God handle that? Well, here's what he says. He says, all right, if you are in me and you are not producing at the moment, the vine dresser is going to come down and he's going to lift you up. Now, a lot of people say, what, lift you up to heaven? You know, or he's going to kill you and take you out of here? No. He's going to do what a vine dresser does. With your crops, what do you do? You, you, see, you see something not produce fruit. You go out there and you see a little limb and he's, and he's weak. He's weak. And gravity has pulled him down to the ground. So he's trailing on the ground, right? Now, if you leave him trailing on the ground, that little limb, you leave a limb trailing on the ground, what's going to happen to that little limb? Ultimately, he's going to die. But let me tell you kind of the process that he goes through. First thing he's going to do is he's going to try to put down roots something he was never designed to do. So he's going to start living a life that he's not designed to live. And he's going to put those little roots down, and those little roots are going to start drawing water up out of the soil. He's not a vine, so those roots don't help him produce fruit. Those roots, as a matter of fact, basically start a process in him that's ultimately going to lead to his rotting death. But he can't produce fruit because he's using all his energy to try to draw water, which he's never designed to do. And he's going to be growing on the bottom of the vine where all the rest of the vine are going to be shading him. And so he's going to wither because he doesn't get any sunlight. And then if you leave him on the ground, he's eventually going to rot because he draws all that water and he's not a vine. He's a limb and he's never going to, a branch and he's never going to produce any fruit. So what do you do if you have a, if you have a, a, a branch that's trailing on the ground and you're the vine dresser? You walk over there and you pick the little fellow up off the ground and you prop him up so he's not on the ground anymore and he becomes part of the vine again. Now I'm going to ask you, what does God prop up a branch on who's who's trailing the ground and needs some support in order to grow back into the branch God created him to be. I'm saying to you, it's the church. We are the hospital for wounded branches. We are the support stand that God puts a little branch that has lost its uh, strength and is in jeopardy of losing its life and is not producing fruit and never will and is doing things that it's never been intended to do. And, and when the vine dresser picks him up, he has to put him on something. He can't just pick him up and let him go. He'll fall right back down. He's got to put him on something. I'm saying, and you know I'm speaking visually here, that the church, the church is the block. The church is the, is the, is the band around him that ties him to the vine. And I'm just saying to you what, what is that if, if, if you, if you, let me back up. If you will stay attached to the vine and then you'll attach yourself to a local body of believers, you can bear fruit in life. But to the extent that you try to go it alone, you are never going to bear fruit. And you're going to be stunted for the rest of your life because you're not intended to be a vine. You're intended to be a branch. All right, let me give you the fourth. Do we have time? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go quick. All right, truth four. The world is going to hate you. This is what Jesus told us. You know, he said, I've got five. I mean, I'm going to tell you these things. One is, I'm God. You've got to believe that. Number two, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live in, in you, and you're going to have to welcome him, and you're going to have to let him have control of your life. And then you're going to have to stay attached to the vine and you're going to have to get you in a local body of believers because that's going to make you strong because the world's going to hate you. Now, the world's not going to hate you until 
some things happen in your life. Like, number one, you start living a Christian life. I mean, they're not, they're not, going, they're not going to hate you as long as, you, as you're dragging around out here looking like everybody else, acting like everybody else, thinking everything that happens is okay not making any stands for anything Christ-like or openly confessing that Jesus is Lord or begin uh, uh, following the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life or becoming a, body, a, a part of a local body of believers that preach the Word of God. Standing up against things that are obviously in violation of the things of God. I, you know what amazes me? What amazes me is what we, who call ourselves Christians, can stand for that is totally not Christ. It's ridiculous. But you start saying something about that, and buddy, this world's going to come after you. They're going to start talking about you around the, around the water fountain. At the, coffee, at, the coffee, at the coffee pot in the office, they're going to be talking about how you flipped out. You become one of those religious people and one of those idiots and, and, you know, years to be, you know, out. Listen, the world is ruled by the spirit of antichrist. This world is not your friend. It is the spirit of antichrist that ruins it. And therefore the world is anti-Christian. Look, look, I'm going to show you. These, th this is ridiculous, these verses. Look at what happened. This is chapter 16, verse 1 through 3. You, you, you'll find it hard to believe. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he's offered, uh, offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Whew, I'm so glad that's not happening yet. I don't want to sound like a martyr. But I'll guarantee you, you go, I have been put out. And you go in the right place and they're assassinating my character all over the place. And you too, anybody that lives for Christ, this world is going to hate you. And so just get ready for it. God says, that's all right because you need it. <laughs> you need to be hated. You need to be uh, accused, ridiculed, blasted, laughed. You need that. And I know y'all are all looking at me and I'm not even looking at you. I'm looking up the ceiling. I don't want to see your eyes bugging out because you're going, I need it. I need it. Well, remember our friend, the bulldog, and remember what happens. When you get hated by the world, <laughs> run to Papa. Here, Papa, Papa, Papa. Does your dog bite? I don't know. He's not my dog. Uh, I mean, God, <laughs> God does all kinds of stuff. All right, here we go. So, Oh, one more thing about this before I move on to five and I'll quit. Look, right in the middle of all of this stuff about, about you being killed, you being run out of the church, people blasting you, talking about you, ridiculing you, stabbing you in the back, hating you and all that kind of stuff. I want you to see where, what, what he does right in the middle of all that discussion, who he brings in. In verse 7, chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So right in the middle of all of this discussion about how horrible it's going to be because the world hates you and how bad they're going to treat you and how they're going to put you out and try to kill you and think they're doing God a service and, uh, and, and all of these horrible, evil things, God plants the Holy Spirit right in the middle of them and says, hey, man, you're going to get with the Holy Spirit. You're going to get right in the middle of all this mess. So, five things. Believe in Christ. As God received the Holy Spirit, that means welcome Him. That means pull out a chair for Him in your life. It means listen to what He says. 
Your life is fruitful. Stay committed to Jesus and faithful to the body of believers because the world is going to hate you. And then here's the last thing. Right in the middle of all that, Jesus says, uh, I'm coming back. Oh, by the way. Jesus says, oh, by the way, <laughs> I'm coming back. Make no mistake about it. I'm coming back. Do you know where all that started? Where he's coming back started? It really started. Now, hang on, and I'm, I'm, I'm running right at you, so don't get afraid. Uh, this all started in chapter 13. This, 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 this Jesus said, I'm coming back. It happened. It started. It, all of this process about everything he has just said to us started in chapter 13. Now, I want you to see this because this is just really, you know, this is like, how did this happen? In chapter, in chapter 13, Jesus is, has had the meal with his disciples, and he, they're sitting down, and they, they're taking the Lord's Supper. And then when they get finished taking the Lord's Supper, when Jesus, this is chapter 13, verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in the spirit. Now, I tried to write something in your notes that I thought sounded like what it was. And I wrote, Jesus shudders with a thought that is so reprehensible and grievous that his face becomes marked with the agony of his soul. I don't know if I got it or not. But anyway, in other words, Jesus became troubled in his spirit. So the disciples noticed that. It's like you're sitting here talking all of a sudden you go to a faraway place and, you're, and, you're, and your family says, Dad, you all right? Or what, 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 what you thinking? Because they see it. It's like a freeze frame. It's like your face takes a freeze frame. And Jesus is just talking with them and having the Lord's Supper, and all of a sudden he has one of those freeze frames. And, and, and Jesus, when he said these things, troubled the spirit, and he testified and he said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, how would you like to be one of those guys in that room when he dropped that bomb? Now, think about it. The, the, the guys are sitting there, the disciples, and he just says, one of you is going to crucify me. I mean, one of you is going to betray me. Now, that's not hard to understand, right? He didn't stutter. That's not a parable. I mean, that's just straight out, one of you is going to betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another. I bet they did. Perplexed. Perplexed about whom he spoke. It was like Peter goes and John goes, you know, and, 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 they all, and they look, and they're just going, he's talking about you. It's not you, is it? And they're all trying to decide, who is he talking about? Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So, John, that's who that is. John never describes himself. He, he thinks he's the one that Jesus loved more than all the rest of them. But anyway, whether he did or not, that's what he called himself, the one that Jesus loved. And I'm sure that graded on Peter. You know, I, <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, he was leaning, he was leaning on Jesus while Jesus like this, like, you know, like they were all leaning and they were taking the Lord's Supper. He was leaning on him and saying, no, Jesus, man, I love you. You're great. And then he's leaning there and Simon Peter, therefore, mentioned to him, to John, to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Uh, hey, John, ask Jesus who he's talking about. He, he's not talking about me, is he? You know, find out. Come on, man. Find out. Find out. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, John says to Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, is there any confusion about what he said and about what he did? He said, 
Who is it, Jesus? And he said, the one that I put this bread in and dip it and give it to him, that's the one that's going to do it. And then he dipped it and he gave it to Judas Iscariot. And if this were a movie, oh, it would be over for Judas, right? We'd go, what? I mean, you, you have 11 other guys up there now, fishermen, uh, ruffians, uh, tough guy, the sons of thunder, uh, James and John, uh, call down fire from heaven, Jesus. Let me do, I'll burn them down myself. They don't worry. I mean, that's the kind of guys you've got in there. And, and James, you know, and, and then, and then, and then uh, here at Peter, Peter, man, cut off a, he just got through cutting off a guard's ear just about six hours ago. I mean, Jesus, you are, you are killing Judas by this. You are just, he might, I mean, you, they're going to kill him. They're not going to let him out of the room. What? Judas, you, you betrayer, you rascal, you... No more Judas. That's what you would think. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Satan entered Judas. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. So he not only gives him the piece of bread, he says... What you do, do quickly. All the rest of these guys sitting around. Who, it, who is it? Who is it? Who did you say it was? But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. How would you like to be in a place that is so dynamically confusing that you couldn't tell what just happened right there? That you're sitting there right at the table and you say, is it me? Ask him if it's me. Is it me? Is it me? It's the guy that I dip and give this to. Dip, give it to him. Uh, whatever you do, do quickly. I'm like, oh, come on, man, tell him. Is it me? Come on. Man. <laughs> For some thought, because Judas had the money box. <laughs> that Jesus said to him, buy these things that we need for the feast or that we should give something to the poor. Uh, the guy said, I thought Jesus was just kind of giving him that piece of bread because, uh, you know, he didn't get his part of the Lord's Supper. And because he had the money box, he said, all right, here, take this piece of bread real quick. And now go on out there and get the stuff we need for the feast. Or, or you know, we need to give something to the poor. So go, you go take care of them. You got the money bag. You know. That's what they said. And so Judas leaves. And then Jesus says to the 11 that are left, he says, okay, guys, you know what the most important thing in life is? That you love one another. That you care for one another. That you take, take this. And then Peter says this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Can't go with me now, but you'll be coming one day, Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay your life down? Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow until you have denied three times that you even know me. If this was a movie, you would fade to black and the credits would begin to roll. Oh, it would be over. But this is not a movie. The very next word out of Jesus' mouth was, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask my Father to send you another comforter just like me. And he'll be with you and he'll teach you and remind you and empower you in your moment of need. So you stay connected to me, to the real vine, to the real way. It's vital that you stay connected to me and also that you stay connected to each other because the world's going to hate you and you're going to need each other. And oh, by the way, I'm coming back after you. These things he spoke so that in me you might have peace. The peace of God which passes all understanding. All right, let's...